Well, good morning, and it's good to see my fellow um, archivists are, are a part of this uh, call, Catherine and Firth and Della and, Be and Beth. Um, we're all really hoping to get back into the church archives and make more progress putting them together. Um, the, uh, this COVID pandemic has really been a time of testing uh, for us as individuals and, and for the church as a whole. And as I was thinking about what might provide a comparison um, earlier in our church history, I first thought about the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. But when we checked, we found that the church only closed for three weeks in the fall of 1918. So that was not a good example. Um, but what came to mind was as a time of testing was the church fire in 1975. And so that was really the genesis of, of um, uh, looking at the records in the archives, talking to a number of members who um, uh, were part of the church in 1975 and putting this presentation uh, together. What I wanna do, as Karen says, is, is um, talk about what happened, illustrate some of the damage with some photographs from the time, uh, and then talk about how the congregation responded and invite your memories and, and comments at the end. Several of you, uh, certainly Judy and Beth and others were, um, were part of the church at that time. So a little bit after 1.30 in the morning on Wednesday, October 1st, 1975, Donna Gilliam, the wife of our senior minister, Jim Gilliam, called Bill and Judy Lutz and said, you better come on down to the church. Um, the, uh, the upper floor of the East Wing where the Montclair Counseling Center was, which Bill had started just three years earlier, was on fire. So the Lutzes came on down, they found uh, 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 Bob Frick, Larry's dad, um, there, he was president of the congregation at the time. So Jim and Donna Gilliam, Bill and Judy Lutz, um, Bob Frick, and presumably Herb Yeager, the associate minister who lived at P2 across the street, stood vigil as, um, um, as the fire raged and the Montclair Fire Department fought it. There was one other person, uh, member of the church who showed up early that morning uh, and that was Tom Pugh, Beth's dad. He was a member of the auxiliary um, um, fire crew here in, um, in Montclair, a volunteer group that would come out when the paid firefighters needed assistance. Uh, he got the call um, uh, early that morning. And after Beth tells me after um, collecting other members of the uh, auxiliary crew came down to the church and his role was really key because he knew knew the building and where things were. Um, about uh, three o'clock in the morning, as Bill recalls, um, Tom took Bill up to the Montclair um, Counseling Center room. The fire at, by this point had moved from the east end toward the assembly room and the sanctuary roof. And ironically, as Bill recalls, they needed a key to get into the room. But when they opened the door, you know, a brilliant full moon uh, was visible through the, uh, the gap in the roof and the ceiling where uh, the fire had raged earlier. And of course, everything in the room was soaked with uh, and charred from the fire. Uh, this is Tom uh, uh, on the roof here, uh, holding the uh, fire hose. Um, the, uh, the firemen had punched holes in the roof of the sanctuary to try to be a get some water in underneath the roof and onto the, uh, the girders or to the beams. Um, but let's take a step back. Uh, earlier that night, three teenage boys, uh, then 15 and 14 years old, broke into the church through a rear door and they took an amplifier uh, for the uh, public address system, ransacked a closet, uh, communion cups were found scattered inside and outside the building, even in the backyard of, the, um, of some of those uh, houses on Summit Street. Uh, the fire, it was determined later, was apparently started in more than one place. One theory was that perhaps the boys uh, lit a candle to grope their way through the darkness and um, a candle may have caught a curtain in the, or drapery in the uh, guild room uh, on fire. In any event, the alarm was raised at 1.34 a.m. The Montclair Fire and Police Department arrived minutes later and found, as they said, the building 
totally involved in fire and all Montclair fire personnel were called out. The Montclair ambulance unit responded with three vehicles, one with a searchlight to help the, uh, illuminate the building, another one to um, uh, pr uh, provide care to the firefighters who were injured. Um, three were injured, two were sent to the hospital. Other members of the church, I think, arrived uh, by certainly by morning. One of them was Cliff Lindholm II, and uh, he brought a camera with him, and um, his Super 8 millimeter film is in the archives. I had it converted to uh, DVD, and then Catherine helped me figure out how to uh, uh, work with Betsy to post it onto YouTube. So this is four minutes of film from um, that Cliff Lindholm took uh, early that morning. Uh, it's silent, uh, it's kind of grainy, but still it gives you a, a sense of what members of the church found uh, when they arrived that morning. One of the fire engines and there's a couple of them in the side driveway there um, uh, on the front lawn inspecting the damage at this point. Let me pause it there. Uh, when the Lutzes got there uh, early in the morning, this uh, rose window on the eastern end, east end was glowing um, red. Uh, and then it was either hit by a, a, a ladder or it just burst from the inside. But you can see by morning that uh, the, the roof has burned through and you can see the daylight through the uh, uh, east uh, window there. Sarah Tamargo's dad is probably in one of these photos, but you can't pick him out. Here's the back driveway with a smaller vehicle. Um, this is the guild room. I'll, I have photographs later that, later that will show this in much better detail. But the windows and the door are burned out. The stairs to the, uh, to the kitchen and above that to where I think the Montclair Counseling Center was. Um, this is, I think, the entrance from the driveway to the back of the sanctuary. Bill Lutz recalls that when they opened the doors, so much water had been poured onto the fire that about six to eight inches of water just poured out the doors when, when they were open. Um, again, in the uh, back of the sanctuary, you can see the charred bits from the ceiling and, and such falling back there. Uh, and the open to the sky through the, uh, through the roof. This is the back of the church. You can see it looked differently, different then. There was no entrance to the assembly room. Oh. I think this may be the, uh, uh, Catherine, perhaps you can help me. I think this may be the entrance to the scout room. Uh, certainly that's something that would have interested um, Cliff Lindholm, but I think this is the basement. Looks like uh, it. Another a small fire vehicle packing up. Pretty weary after a night of fighting the fire, I should think. It's the back of the church um, or the east wing. Again, the, uh, the guild room, just a complete loss. And, uh, you know, packing up. Members of the fire department. This is looking into the assembly room. And again, I'll have photos that will, will show this better. Uh, I'll pause it here. This answer to, this uh, frame from the, the film answered a question that Paul Sionis had about whether the tower was ever enclosed. And, and indeed it was on three sides uh, with um, you know, these uh, fan lights and, and uh, uh, glazed doors. 
Uh, Cliff Lindholm tells me that some of the scout groups used it. I assume youth groups also used the ground floor. I think some of you can correct me, but I think in the 1930s, uh, George Vincent had his church office on the second floor of the tower. And again, in the back of the church, looking up at the, uh, at the roof. Uh, nearly to the end. And this is, um, that's Jim Gilliam on the left, uh, the senior minister of the church at the time. And our church was used by a Chinese congregation. So I'm presuming this was the pastor of the uh, Chinese congregation who, uh, who came to uh, uh, see the damage. So let me uh, stop that and come back. So, um, the Montclair Times took a, a, a series of photos that morning of the fire. Uh, I, I haven't found any photos of upstairs, but I, uh, I'm going to start on the east end in the guild, guild room and work uh, our way to the sanctuary. Uh, you know, the windows are burned out, the door, the piano is a complete loss. I understand that the um, uh, Women's Guild had. Um, had installed a new carpet uh, weeks or a couple months before this, so that was a complete loss. Um, and Beth Pugh tells me about the only thing that survived in this room were, were some birch logs in the fireplace. And <laughs> believe it or not, they, um, uh, they emerged unscathed from the fire. Uh, the kitchen, uh, this is a scan of, uh, of an, a photo in a newspaper, so it's not as clear as the others, but you can see that the, uh, the, roof, uh, the ceiling structure has collapsed, uh, ventilations uh, on the kitchen counter, the windows and doors have, have burned out, just a, a, a thorough mess. Outside the kitchen, uh, the ladies' room on the far left there, um, I don't know whether the communion cups were kept in this closet here they are now, um, uh, but that was uh, certainly burned some cups up there. This room divider, this pleated room divider uh, burned. And moving into the assembly room and looking back toward that area outside the, uh, outside the kitchen, um, certainly smoke damage. Uh, the fire uh, burned mostly in the, uh, in the gap between the second floor and the, and the roof at this point. Another view of the assembly room, and some of you will recall that there were Sunday school rooms that divided the space on the upper floor and the, uh, the lower level. The stairs were on the far right at that point, but you can see the water on the floor and just the, the jumble um, in this space. Moving into the sanctuary, um, we're in the back and we're looking toward the driveway. You can see the, uh, you know, the trees on the Summit Avenue property uh, uh, out that door. Uh, these were deacon benches in the back, I understand, but all this bits of the, of the, of the roof and ceiling on the floor. Uh, the pews were this very light colored wood then, um, but all the hymnals uh, were a loss. The lectern Bible is actually in the archives. It's rather crinkled. It, it didn't get as thoroughly soaked in, in the um, uh, church members wanted to retain that lectern Bible as a memento of, of, of the fire. Uh, you can also see how close they got, the fire got to the conic windows, just a couple feet away, but the conic windows emerged unscathed. Uh, and then the Tiffany windows almost unscathed. Um, uh, I think a, a, a fire ladder or something else just lodged one piece of, of, of uh, the central window which was uh, later repaired and it didn't quite get the color match, but uh, uh, the conic windows and the Tiffany windows uh, came through fairly well. Um, uh, a view of the uh, sanctuary roof, you can see there are, there, there are four bays, uh, three sets of girders, four bays in the sanctuary. It, it burned through to the sky through three bays. Um, and, but was stopped just before I got to the, um, to the chancel. Uh, this is a view from the outside looking 
back toward what we just saw. Again, you can see how close it got to the conic windows. And this is the same um, scene that, you know, we saw Tom Pugh holding the fire hose on earlier. Um, uh, uh, front of the portico over the driveway and the entrance into the uh, back of the church. Um, so very extensive damage. Um, you know, Bob Frick and Jim Gilliam got a letter out to the whole congregation later uh, and they comment later that day um, and they, they commented on the countless angels who showed up. Um, uh, church members and some, uh, some neighbors just to begin to clean up to salvage whatever they could. Bill and Judy Lutz and a friend from St. James uh, pulled what they could out of the um, uh, Montclair Counseling Center and spread the items on the lawn to begin to dry. Janet and Larry Frick, pretty young then, but they showed up to clean. Um, Alice Lockwood, whom I don't know, uh, or is, is um, credited with organizing this vast effort to retrieve and scour the china and flatware uh, before the smoke damage really took hold of, of the china. Um, uh, all the choir robes and clerical robes were collected and sent out that first day for uh, a preliminary cleaning. Cliff Lindholm tells me that they just couldn't get the smoke out of the choir robes and they had to um, replace them. Um, uh, presumably after taking his, uh, his film, uh, Cliff uh, walked over to the uh, Vincent building and found um, uh, Jim Gilliam, and he says Art Manning, but I wonder if it was uh, Bob Frick. Art Manning uh, replaced Bob as president of the congregation a few months later. But anyway, Cliff offered to lead the, what he called a limit loss uh, effort. Um, and uh, he found a contractor in, time, in, in town to begin to put uh, plywood uh, on, on the roof uh, to protect it from the elements, uh, tarps until the plywood could get on. Uh, they covered the, uh, the stained glass windows to prevent further damage. Uh, he found a um, company out in Sussex County that would retrieve the, um, the pews, uh, and they did before the end of the week, uh, retrieve the pews and store them, and then eventually refinish the, uh, the pews. Um, and a security guard was put out there. They had to restart the boiler, uh, try to get electricity uh, uh, running again so that some work could be done within the building. Uh, during the day, Jim Gilliam uh, was already in touch with Mount Hebron School about um, um, uh, uh, arranging for the church to hold its service at, at Mount Hebron on the following Sunday. By the evening, the uh, governing board met to uh, take stock of the situation. This happened to be the first year of the new form of church governance. Up until 1975, it was a board of trustees and a church council. Uh, we now call the governing board the leadership council. But anyway, they met that night. They confirmed Cliff Lindholm in his role of leading emergency action to prevent additional damage and to conserve the property. And they called a special congregational meeting for October 26 to um, elect a building committee, which of course would do much of the work going forward. Um, so on uh, the next Sunday, uh, happened to be Worldwide Communion Sunday. This is a photo of members uh, walking into Mount Hebron School, now of course Buzz Aldrin School, you know, with a church banner, uh, Peace and Love, um, uh, posted outside. And Larry Frick remembers that Jim Gilliam really made a splendid choice for the first hymn, uh, that uh, old e and R hymn uh, to the tune of Finlandia, we would be building. And that kind of set the tone for the whole uh, spirit of the church in, in coming back. It was uh, Worldwide Communion Sunday. Members of the church had baked loaves of bread that were passed among the rows of the auditorium. And the little silver communion cups that were used then um, uh, had all uh, had been polished and, and were ready to be used um, in this service. Um, as Catherine and Firth and Della and, and, and Beth know, we have uh, four or five of those soot-stained communion cups in the archives, again, um, uh, that members um, uh, held back as a memento of this um, event. Uh, Jim Gilliam's sermon title was The God of the Ashes, 
And he ended with this declaration, the heart of Union Church cannot be burned. We shall demonstrate to this community what it means to be up and alive everywhere. And everyone I've talked to really credits Jim Gilliam with remarkable leadership during this period. Um, and he kept emphasizing the church is the people, it's not the building. You know, we, we can come back from this. Um, and Beth uh, tells me that um, uh, he had actually decided to leave at this point, feeling that his work had been done in helping to uh, kind of mend the church after some of the um, challenges of the Vietnam War era. And, but he held off uh, announcing his departure after the fire took place, and he stayed two more years to make sure that the restoration continued um, apace. Um, the, for the next 15 months, the church um, worshiped at the women's club down the street. This is the sign that uh, was put out on the front lawn. Uh, you can see the detritus from the fire um, on the, uh, uh, outside the uh, assembly room here. Um, I think the youth, senior youth group also met at the women's club. The uh, Montclair Counseling Center moved into offices at St. James, but everything else, both the church committees and and groups and, and the community groups that use the church, uh, I think fit into uh, the Vincent building. They had to use every square inch and it was a feat of scheduling to pull it off. But in that way, the, the church um, uh, continued to meet. And of course, for a congregational church, so there were committees, uh, Cliff Lindholm and the Limit Loss Committee with eight members, the Building Committee with 11 members, uh, Bill Knowles chaired it and again gets enormous credit for his, for his job. Uh, it was, uh, they took real care to have a mix of male and female and um, uh, adult and young. There was a youth rep on the committee uh, and the 11 members were, um, were um, elected at that special meeting in October. One of the most important subcommittees was the architect subcommittee with Art Manning and Marilyn Uter. Uter. Um, uh, they reviewed some 30 firms before recommending the architect um, that the church ended up using. And the insurance claims subcommittee uh, was also critical because it was charged with uh, coming up with the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, um, list of things that have been damaged and the uh, estimate of the uh, of the cost of replacing those um, uh, the building and the um, uh, uh, chairs and everything down to down to the most uh, uh, the smallest uh, item and then toward the end of the process a rededication committee was formed with 15 members and once again cliff lindholm uh, stepped into it you know going through the uh, the records in the archives um, and there's a pretty good set of records, about a linear foot of material. But there's so many familiar names. Uh, Bob Frick was president in 1975, Larry's dad. Tom Pugh, in addition to being a member of the auxiliary crew, was secretary of the congregation, Beth's father. Um, and he was also charged with writing letters of, of, of thanks or gratitude um, that were published in the Montclair Times you know, thanking the fire department, the police department, the ambulance unit, and the Montclair Red Cross who showed up on that October 1st day with, um, with refreshments while people worked to clean up. And Cleo, uh, Cleo Nesbitt was chair of the uh, Women's Guild, uh, Judy's mother. Bill Lutz, I've mentioned, Cliff Lindholm, also in addition to the Limit Loss and Rededication Committee was the liaison with the Boy Scouts for their needs. Betty Jane Bailey, um, from September 1976 was the Minister of Parish Education and, and um, much involved in the, uh, in the final months of the process. And Janet Metz, you know, Charlie and Janet moved away a few years ago, but Janet was a member of the Rededication Committee. And, and I'm sure I missed some others, just a lot of familiar names um, uh, in the process. Um, this is a big four by six foot, uh, you know, blue uh, uh, butcher paper. And I just put it on the floor and tried to take a photo because I think it gives a great sense of how much organization and planning went into this process uh, for the period from the end of October 
when the building committee was formed through to the um, end of January when the annual meeting took place. It, it was at the end of January in, in those years, not the end of February, what we do now. I suspect Bill Knowles uh, put this together, um, uh, but these two person subcommittees uh, worked on different parts of the, of the task, uh, the Cleo Nesbitt with the, uh, um, working with Skip Morris on determining the needs and desires of the Counseling Center and the Women's Guild. And so it went, John Osborne was the youth rep. Um, but all this visit the staff, uh, visit the different committees and groups within the church to understand their needs and desires. Uh, article for dimension, dimension article, report to the governing board, article for dimension, dimension article. So all, this feed, all these feedback loops to the uh, members of the church uh, up here, uh, you know, forming the subcommittee, the possible contractors, selecting the contractors. And so it went through to uh, coming up with a cost estimate for the insurance claim. All this driving to the annual meeting and all this taking place before personal computers. <laughs> and so there are lots of handwritten notes uh, when they were comparing contractors and architects, they took ledger paper and drew columns on them and and all, lots of handwritten notes. Um, it would be a lot easier today than it was then. Um, one of the things they did, and I really admire this, is uh, the members of the building committee touched base with every group within the church and asked for their needs and their desires. Because um, the goal was not just to replace what had been there, but to use Joe Biden's phrase, to build back better. Um, so these two person subcommittees touch base with everybody. And the list of these needs and desires was, was put in this blue spiral bound um, uh, booklet, which soon got called the blue book. Um, and the results were reported at the annual meeting. And the building committee used it as kind of a checklist in, in discussions with the architect and what would we try to do and what, not, what would we not try to do. Well, I've exposed at the bottom of the screen a few things that the um, members of the clergy uh, staff, um, um, uh, particularly um, Herb Yeager and, and uh, oh, I think it was Marilyn Green, I'm not sure of her first name, the, the, um, uh, also a, 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 a member of the clergy staff. But they wanted to, if you can read this, achieve greater flexibility in the sanctuary by having movable pews, or if you couldn't do that, at least have movable pews in the, in the front of the sanctuary. And is there any way we could get the side pews on an angle so as to face the chancel? Um, in the end, those things were, 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 did not become part of the project. Um, the rebuilding plan, uh, which was, was uh, presented to the congregation at the end of May, 1976. So how many months later is that three? Uh, eight months later, uh, the building plan was ready. Um, uh, so you can see this photograph on the left is the scaffolding, uh, I assume was used by the contractor to kind of estimate the damage to the, uh, to the roof and what it would cost to repair it. Um, um, anyway, the, the building committee had met 22 times since the fire. That works out to um, just about three times a month. And it come up with a key objective of restoring and enhancing the beauty of the church. Uh, the cost estimate for, um, for the project was $970,000. Uh, uh, 805,000 of that was the insurance settlement. The church put in a claim for an amount larger than that. The insurance company offered less than that. And after two or three iterations, this is the number that they uh, settled on. $33,000 had already been contributed, uh, $7,000 in interest. Remember, this was a pretty high interest rate period, leaving um, $125,000 to be raised in a new capital campaign. And that was what the congregation needed to vote on uh, and, um, uh, at this special meeting. And the resolution to proceed with the plan as presented was approved unanimously. And the building committee got a standing ovation for its, for its work uh, over the prior eight months. 
Um, there were three professional advisors who played key role in working with the congregation. Um, the architect who was selected was Levon Kachadorian. Um, Armin Kachaturian. Armin tells me that's the same family name as his, just uh, transliterated in a slightly different way, but there's no uh, uh, relationship. Um, uh, uh, Levon Kachadorian had been trained in England and had worked on a, um, a number of church restorations, uh, churches that had been damaged in World War II. Uh, he had also been hired by the Park United Methodist Church uh, in Bloomfield after its uh, roof had been struck by lightning, um, been hired by the Glen Ridge School District to help repair a, a fire damaged elementary school. The Newark schools used his firm on some 20 um, schools. So a very experienced firm, um, very close by. The contractor chosen um, here in the center is Willard Peterson, who's um, uh, family company with the OA Peterson Construction Company here in Montclair. Willard Peterson lived in Upper Montclair. He was hired first for the, um, the insurance estimate and then uh, for the contractor on the restoration. And at that May meeting in 1976, the building committee felt that they really needed some advice from a design consultant uh, for the, you know, the thousand decisions on what color the carpet should be, the paint in the sanctuary, um, lots and lots of details. So Barbara Schurmeister was, was hired. She um, worked as a, the interior designer for the Statler Hilton hotel chain and been responsible for the Waldorf Astoria Tower in New, York, in New York and some homes in Short Hills. She was a member of the Short Hills Community Church and you know, the Congregational Church. So she, <laughs> I think it was probably also a plus on her side that she knew what it meant to work with committees, um, with church committees. Um, so the aim was to get back into the sanctuary to restore the that that part of the building first, uh, and then proceed with the rest of the building. And they actually the first service back in the in the in the sanctuary was on January second, nineteen seventy seven. Some five hundred people attended. Chandler Granis in his history talks about a spirit of spontaneous Thanksgiving and celebration. And the first special service was uh, the ordination of Betty Jane Bailey. This is a photo of, of her celebrating uh, communion um, at that service. Um, that would occur two weeks later on January 16th. And in the meanwhile, work continued on the assembly room, uh, which was uh, much reconfigured. You'll recall in the last year or two, we tried to figure out, could we get rid of that step up from the um, from the main part of the assembly room up into toward the uh, the kitchen, they asked the same question in 1977, and it turns out there's a support beam in there that just has to stay there. So that's why that step remained. The kitchen was expanded, uh, the guild room was repaired, the rest of the east wing, and uh, this was important to the men of the church. So there was no men's bathroom on the first floor, um, and so. Um, uh, three bathrooms were added, one in the vestry area, the men's uh, bathroom near the, um, uh, the, the entrance to the assembly room, and then that bathroom at the back of the child care room at the far east end of the building. Um, in the plan for restoring the sanctuary really emphasized design integrity, integrity and they, uh, the church went all in for what they called the Norman style, this kind of almost uh, slightly medieval look with rounded arches uh, that were put on the back wall. Uh, the doors to the assembly room in the center were added, the crenellated um, molding on the top of the um, of those doors and the benches and these pilasters on the side on both sides that I don't think are structural, just added to break up the blankness of the back of, of the flat wall. Uh, everything which had been blonde wood was stained dark. Um, wrought iron was introduced for the first time in railings and fittings, including these chandeliers added for the first time. Uh, a quatrefoil design became an element used over and over again in the design, including the, 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 four, um, the, 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 the suggestion of a quatrefoil on the, um, on the chandeliers. Um, this cross at the back um, was made by Ray Riley, a member of the building committee. 
who had an advanced degree in design, I think from Columbia, but he used timber salvaged from the, um, the fire to create that cross. Um, a smaller cross was made for Jim Gilliam and presented um, to him and the Gilliam family drove it out and gave it to Dave Shaw and I recently, and I think it's in Dave's office now. And when I made this presentation to the men's group um, a couple weeks ago, um, Mark Bailey um, in our discussion afterwards held up to, the, to his camera the, um, uh, a, a similar small cross made for uh, Betty Bailey um, and presented to her um, uh, at the rededication service, uh, uh, also from the salvaged timber. What was not emphasized in all this, and we're living with it, is multiple uses of our sanctuary space or, or any sense of flexible space uh, within the, the um, sanctuary. Uh, in the front, a number of things were done. Um, uh, the, the wrought iron railings were added and replacing, uh, there had been paneling here before. Um, Obviously, the organ was was ruined by the fire. Every pipe had to be taken out and, and cleaned and restored. Um, but the quatrefoil design on the organ screens on both sides. Um, oh, the slate floor was added in the uh, uh, in the chancel uh, for the first time. Again, everything stained rather dark, and the paint color was also introduced at this time. Um, and all this work toward a rededication weekend, a three-day event at the end of April, beginning of May, 1977. There were concerts and planted trees. The Betty Bailey working with the children of the church asked how they wanted to participate. And they came up the, with the idea of a time capsule uh, to be open 50 years later. Um, I think it may be in the ramp, um, but that's only, that's five years from now. So we may need to keep that in mind. Um, we know what's in the time capsule because we have Betty Bailey's files in the, in, in the archives and, and there's a careful listing of each item that's in the time capsule. There was a dinner on the Saturday night followed by a congregational meeting. I presume the meeting was mostly to thank those who, who took part. Uh, a rededication service on the Sunday uh, and a festival of music in the afternoon. Um, since I'm now involved with the outreach committee, I was glad to see that as part of the uh, service of worship, uh, the congregation uh, established the Union Congregational Church Scholarship Fund at Talladega College in Alabama. That's one of the historically black colleges and universities and presented a uh, trustee of Talladega with a $4,000 check at the rededication service and a pledge of of $11,000 more over the uh, next couple of years. Um, so just to go back to where I started about times of testing, it got me thinking, uh, comparing the church fire of, of 75 and um, um, the, uh, uh, the pandemic that we're uh, living through now, um, both have certainly been times of testing for the congregation. The, the church fire in 1975 was a sudden test, uh, unexpected. Um, uh, the damage occurred in one day. Uh, and, and, you know, the next steps were clear, not the decisions, the, the umpteen decisions needed to be made, but you knew you needed to salvage what you could. Um, you know, gather the facts for the insurance claim, hire a contractor, an architect, come up with a plan for rebuilding, raise the money for the process and, 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 and follow it through. We've been facing, a, I think, a different time of testing in that it's, it's unfolded. We didn't know at the beginning what to expect. We're still not sure what to expect. It's, it's, it's a cumulative test and, and it's, it has been uncertain the whole way. Um, the church fire kept the congregation out of the sanctuary for 15 months. Um, we're now into our 13th month of, of being out of the sanctuary and I suspect we'll, we'll reach and perhaps exceed that 15 month um, uh, period. Um, the worship of the church continued in 1975 in a different space, just as it's continued um, uh, over the past year, uh, but in a different medium. Um, and the work of the church continued. Um, uh, 
uh, in those days in person, uh, in person meetings in the Vincent building or wherever, uh, we've tried to continue the work of the church uh, just as we're doing this morning uh, uh, in, in virtual meetings. In 1975, the fire caused a, a, a fresh look, those go back to those needs and desires that, that every uh, uh, group in the church offered, uh, a fresh look at our spaces for worship and for community meetings. And you know, we're challenged now with, with taking a fresh look at, at, I think, at how we worship and what creates and sustains um, communities and uh, community, you know, how we, with our expanded toolbox from our experience of, of, of Zoom worship, what should we keep, what should we never do again? Uh, all those questions are, are ones that um, we're facing now. So with that, let me uh, 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 see if I can stop sharing and, um, come back uh, and see if uh, Judy and Beth and others must certainly have memories that, uh, that they would want to share. Um, Tim, one of the questions was, were, are, were there any particular actions by the firefighters to keep the stained glass windows safe? Uh, well, I understand that people, different people, some people have even accredited Tom Pugh with this, but with a real effort to, uh, to protect them. Remember they had a, uh, a layer of protected glass on them, um, which certainly helped. The fire hadn't gone all the way to the east end. I'm talking about the Tiffany windows here. Um, uh, you know, in the end they discovered that glass was, was uh, tinted green. And so when it was replaced with a clear uh, protective cover, the colors of the, the uh, colors in the Tiffany windows really popped afterwards. But in terms of the conic windows, I think they were working above them and and uh, in the dark and and uh, doing their best and it just the fire didn't go down to the walls so the conic windows uh, survived. Um, Sarah Tamargo has a question. I remember asking my father about that and he said, they, they didn't really have, they knew they were stained glass windows in general. The firefighters knew, that, of course, it's a church. They are stained glass windows. Of course, they're valuable. But yes, he said, I have to tell you, in the heat, literal heat of the moment, the windows were not <laughs> a focal point in terms of saving the structure. It was just luck that they weren't. Well, I, I understand that the, the lead fireman, uh, the captain that day, just when he had to call the crew off or whatever, he just felt awful because he thought he was going to lose the whole building. And it was thought that if those girders, beam supports for the roof had been steel instead of wood, um, that the heat of the fire might have uh, buckled the steel. And if that had happened, the walls would have collapsed in. Uh, but the, the wood um, uh, 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 withheld the, uh, uh, um, uh, held strong despite the fire, um, and, and the walls were saved, even though, uh, and Armin tells me that above the assembly room, you can still see a number of the charred beams. Uh, they had to be sistered. They still had some support, but they had to be sistered with other uh, beams. Uh, in that gap between the second row, uh, second floor and the uh, roof over the assembly room. In, in my father's 35 years of being a firefighter, I wasn't alive during all of those years, but um, I never remember him being as emotional about a fire, except maybe when there were um, some actual deaths, which is not common in Montclair but being just devastated about the, the destruction of the building and um, how um, difficult it was to fight the fire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Barbara asked, was a motive ever established? Was it just teenage mischief or was there something more? What was going on with the teenagers? Um. It's, I think it's something where I give the congregation a lot of credit. I, uh, the, uh, 
the boys were known to a number of members in the congregation and nobody has mentioned their names, at least that I know of. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was probably more mischief. There were some beer cans found outside the, the, the kitchen door, that sort of thing. And the church really worked to, um, it, it, they weren't identified until the following August. So um, they were, at least they weren't arrested to the following August. Uh, one of them, Bill Lutz tells me, it was determined that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and um, uh, Jim Gilliam worked to find him a place in a, um, uh, in a UCC run um, uh, facility or camp or counseling center in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and the church also uh, worked to um, try to reduce the sentence for sentences uh, applied to the kids and, and Bill offered to counseling, all that sort of thing. Um, uh, but I, it's, it, yeah, it's probably mischief that really went wrong. It wasn't an accident. I know one of the stories that I always heard was that cushions were taken from the guild room and piled on the stove in the in the kitchen and then the stove was turned on. Could be. Which is in, kind of interesting because the fireplace where those logs that Tim mentioned are uh, is on the other side of the wall and they were the only thing in that room that didn't burn, which everybody <laughs> always thought was ironic that the entire room was charred except the white, um, birch logs in the fireplace. I wanna mention the cross that I'm wearing um, because this cross is made from um, handmade nails that were found in the beams that needed to be replaced. Um, Billy Anderson, who was a um, high school boy who lived in one of the houses on Summit Avenue behind, behind the church, um, may actually uh, while it was kids that started the fire, we may also be grateful to a kid that it wasn't any worse than it was. Um, the story that I always heard was that Billy was up late uh, because he didn't have his homework done for the next day. I'm not sure if it was a test he was studying for or a paper that he needed to write. And he happened to look out the window and he saw some kind of strange orange glow in the kitchen. And he went and got his mother up to look at it. And she went and called the Gilliams and that's how that, that all got, um, otherwise it probably would have burned a, a lot longer because it was you know, in the middle of the block and, and not a lot at an hour that people weren't up. Um, Billy also made jewelry and one of the things he discovered when they took the beams down was that there were all these handmade nails. And so he took them and made crosses and these were given to the members of the building committee. So the one that I'm wearing is was my mom's. Wow. Um, and they, they came from that same beam that the wood came from that Ray made the um, the cross that hangs in the back. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia and John want to know were there any other church fires in the area at that time? Yes. Judy, you want to <laughs> You're okay. saying yes. <laughs> yeah, saying, um, it seems to me that the fire at, I believe, what was the date of the fire at Watch on Kong? Because I think that was a year or so be before our fire. Because they also had a bad fire that damaged their sanctuary. Um, you know, Beth, you want to tell your story about the sofa? Oh, the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, firemen were moving all furniture out of the guild room and the um, at the end when they're all doing the cleanup one of the engines starts to leave and the sofa reignited it's been smoldering and all of a sudden it bursts into flame and my father looked over and saw these firemen carrying the sofa, running after the fire engine, yelling, wait, wait. <laughs> so they had to stop and put out the sofa one more time. And Beth, you uh, also mentioned how you, you were off at college, but you came home, what, at Thanksgiving time or something, and, and Jill, Jim Gilliam showed you the, um, the sanctuary uh, at that point. 
right, right. He well, he did. He gave me the key. The to key. Go in. Yeah. He was busy, you know, Thanksgiving weekend, and I'm yeah. saying, can I see the inside of the church? <laughs> and uh, just to be there all alone in this empty sanctuary, no pews, huge room. You could still smell the smoke, yeah. the smoky smell. It was just eerie, a very strange feeling. And you think it's gone. It's never going to come back. This mm -hmm. is ridiculous. It's such a huge loss. And Linda, you you were part of the insurance. Were you part of the insurance uh, claim committee? Yeah, I was, yeah, was going to mention something. I'm sorry I'm late. I hope this is being, it is being recorded. I'm sorry. I, I was doing some recipe stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the uh, I wasn't part of the insurance committee at that time. I was too young. But um, three months prior to the fire, the insurance committee, which was held, held uh, the head was Charles, Charles, oh, he was a very prominent member of the church. He worked for uh, Johnson and Higgins in New York as a vice president. And he said, you know, I think we need to check out the value of this church building. And sure enough, they got the insurance company to come out and evaluate the building. And we were about 45% underinsured. So he increased the value of the building prior to the fire. Save our hide for sure. That would have been incredibly devastating. It would have been difficult to figure out how we could have possibly uh, replaced that and did the fire. What, what was the total cost of the fire damage at that time? Well, they, they, the claim was for 805000 Okay, I thought and, so. Yeah. And then the rebuilding project came in at 970000 Right. And again, these are $1970. So, um, right, yeah, yeah. So when you think of that number of 800000 now, it doesn't seem like much money if you were 45% short. But back then, it was a lot of money. Still a lot of money. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but it was, it really, it, it really took us from, the total devastation, as as Judy and I remember very well, uh, and I remember Judy's mom, who was on the committee, and <laughs> Judy's mom was so tenacious. Everything she got involved in, she did well. I gotta tell you, uh, she just did it to a T. She dedicated as much time as necessary to whatever the project was. And boy, did she dedicate time to the build the rebuilding project, right to the fine lines of things like selecting the new lights in the ceiling. Weren't they designed or something, Judy, the lights in the sanctuary? I never saw my mother during that time. Yeah, yeah, well, well. That, well, committee, I, met, that committee met once a week. And yeah. um, when, it, when they weren't meeting that, as a committee, they were out doing their research, talking to all the other groups or whatever they were doing. Um, I hardly ever saw my mother during that time. In fact, her, her I think it was her 70th or 71st birthday was on a night that they had a meeting. Oh, I remember that. And uh, she couldn't miss it. So I, got a, I called Bill Knowles and got permission to bring a cake <laughs> and lemonade or something to the meeting, which absolutely astounded my mother. She couldn't believe that they would even take the time for that. But I went early with my sheet cake and my lemonade and we had a quick little little birthday party before her. And then I cleaned up and got out in time for their meeting to start. Because um, there was nothing, nothing that interfered with that committee as far as she was concerned and the work that they, the work that they needed to do. And I don't know if this was mentioned before and whether it's even true or not, maybe, well, between uh, Tim and Judy, wasn't there a piece of the stained glass windows, the Tiffany windows that slid down between that extra support uh, layer in there that, stood, it, that came to the ground and somebody picked up, took it home and brought it back later on and was just had to be put back in its spot. Does anyone know about that story? A piece had to be replaced. I don't think it was the same one because it's the coloring doesn't match. Yeah, yeah. Charlie Metz's Charlie Metz's memory is that it, it there was one piece that needed to be replaced in the center. In the, uh, in the Tiffany windows, or in the, the Tiffany windows, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they didn't quite get the colors. At least today, the color is not quite a match. But 
uh, it's just astonishing that that um, that it came through with such little damage. Well, I tell you, the reason why it came through with such little damage is because there was a third layer of glass in between yeah. the exterior and the actual interior uh, windows. Yeah, when that, when that green, was yeah. yeah, when that when the project when the restoration occurred, that layer was taken out. And that muted look to the windows all of a sudden was gone and the radiant brightness came through. And of course we put a plexiglass on there to protect the exterior, which in the restoration in 2011, thanks to Christine Brown's per perseverance on pushing me to get that done. I wasn't interested in Tiffany windows at that time and the conic windows, I was interested in the bricks and the mortar, <laughs> the stones. But we did it with a wonderful company that's one of the two in the United States that just happens to be in New Jersey who are the best. And we put in the, oh, be quiet. Joyce talks when I'm on, we put in the same uh, glass as you have in your windshield. It's very expensive to do that, but the conic windows and the Tiff and the Tiffany windows have that glass now. And that's why even when you go in there on a cloudy day and just sit there for a moment to, to have a little prayer, the radiant colors of the windows are there. Thank you, Linda. Are there any other questions or anything from anyone? You can either just unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Tim, this has been wonderful. Ah, oh, amazing. Well, I think it's good to keep in mind that the work that Catherine and Firth and Bella and Beth are doing along, and I'm part of that crew in the archives, there are so many good stories that, that can be uh, excavated from the archival materials. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but it's <laughs> it's uh, um, it's it's been um, uh, um, a big project, but a fun project, and we hope to get back to it when we're all fully vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> I, think a, I think a future project could even be, as Linda says, about the conic windows, um, um, which are quite special, and and um, uh, and such. There is a little pamphlet on the conic windows. Tim, you have that? I'm sure we do. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, um, there's a lot of information about the conic windows in, in the archives. Tim, uh, one of the things I would suggest for uh, your committee maybe, uh, thinking about restoration and all the money we've spent on the building over the years, the um, fire, and the money we spent there to restore the building. The restoration in 2000 that Susan Goffrey undertook, which was, I think, 1.2 million. And then our restoration in 11 and 12, that was about 1.8 million on the main building. The rest was in the education building. I think it would be good to put those in a separate collective uh, I don't know, a little notebook or something. I think the membership, president passed, well, not the past, they're in the garden. They know what's happening. But I think the future membership, current and future membership should understand the, 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 the uh, evolution of that building uh, uh, that we have been very good caretakers of. At, at, for times we weren't so good. But I think that right now we have a lot of pride in, in, in that building uh, that a lot of people don't truly understand. I do, because I worked on it for two years. But I think we should, we need to, we need to share the good news so people feel that. And they, when they walk in the building, they feel the sense of the commitment that people made to the building. And we can't forget the trust who gave us 750,000. That was a big help to the restoration. Phase two was done in, in 2012, only because of the money they gave and the additional money that people uh, committed in phase one, which we raised beyond. So those are the good news stories that we, we yeah. need to tell everybody, tell ourselves. There's another good news story about over the years, the outreach uh, efforts of the church. Uh, 
yeah. uh, not so tangible as the building, but just as important to the, uh, the work of the church. Right. Um, it's extraordinary what's happened over the decades um, in what was first called field service. And then in 1975, again, the big year 1975 was changed to outreach. I see um, Isabel's Sarah asking Kamar a little bit about the flexibility in the pews and why it wasn't followed up on. Um, at first, I thought that uh, I was. Uh, it came from the uh, the junior members of the clergy. I thought at first it was a senior member. So um, um, uh, it came from Herb Yeager and and um, if her name hey. was Marilyn uh, Green. Mary. Uh, Mary Mary Green. Thank you. I, I sorry to go blank on that. Um, they were using banners and they were trying all uh, lots of ways to kind of um, uh, introduce uh, new way, new elements into our worship. And they were really hoping for much more flexible space. In the midst of everything else, it was, and I've seen the notes of the building committee, it was crossed off very early on. Um, and just, uh, you know, let's not deal with that now. Uh, it's much more an element now as we think about what we've learned over the last 13 months and, and uh, the different ways of, of expressing, um, expressing worship. I'm Sarah Tamargo, and then I think we will um, try and close our meeting here. Sarah Tamargo wanted to say something or ask something? No, I, my, my question was answered. Okay, great. Anybody else? Any other last minute questions? Karen, not a question, but I... Um, it's really, I mean, the, in addition to the tangible, there was the intangible at the time. There was, there was a feeling in town among some people that Union Kong would never survive this, that the fire would be our end. Um, I, remember, right. I right. remember the day of the fire, I left school that morning after I taught my first period class. I don't know how, I don't know what I did, but I know I taught it. And then I left and came to church. And when I returned to school, the very first person I spoke to said to me, you know, that's the end of Union Kong. Um, you'll, you'll never recover from this fire. And so there, while there was a lot of support in town, there was also that element of, gotcha. of we, because were, is we it, were finished. Isn't it true that it, that was the end of the Wachung church, the fire yeah, yeah. did yeah. that church in? Yes. Yeah. And I think maybe that was part of it. That was what happened to Wachung and you just couldn't come back from something like that and we would never. Um, well, we just, Wa Wachung also did not have adequate insurance. That's what happened to Wachung Church. Oh, is that what happened? Yes, yes. We, we uh, as I say, Charlie, who I can't remember his last name now, he saved our bacon. He really did. But you know, also Judy, you remember back then, there was a lot of competition in town between churches. Right. And it wasn't positive competition, yes. right? I, it was, I was quite, not, it was I quite not how to put that into words, but yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Competition between First Kong and ourselves was always adversarial, always when they had a large membership, and uh, when they're when they dwindled down, then of course. You know, it wasn't all that yapping going back and forth, but and some of the smaller churches resented us because we were big and we could do more. And and so there was a lot of yes, there was a lot of negative competition between churches. Karen, didn't you talk to Cena Nelson about this? Yes, I did talk to Cena Nelson. I Beck, I talked to her yesterday even and she's hmm. going to watch the recording of this. And she said <laughs> that they were at that time living in Pen Pennsylvania. But she said, so they weren't here during the actual fire, but she said when she came back to the church, moved back mm -hmm. to town, she said there was a warmth and enthusiasm in the congregation that wasn't there. Now, I'm sure that there was, a, there, there was enthusiasm before the fire, but after the fire, it just brought the congregation together and they worked together and, and like an angel was over the whole congregation. So it was good to hear that too, that they, the people again, rallied together and um, look at where we are now. So we're so thankful for everything. I want to thank Tim for this wonderful, wonderful presentation that we all didn't, not, none of us knew too much about it. And now we know so much. So I do want to thank him for the women. And we have a little gift certificate for Tim to go to the Holstons with his family <laughs> as a thank you. So we know you can either get some ice cream or hamburgers or whatever. So we thank you very much and I'll drop it off at your house.
Oh boy, grilled cheese sandwich and an ice cream cone. Yeah. There you go. What more can you ask? It's a, back in the 1975 and it's still going now. Yeah. So that's great. So um, I want to let everyone know, and I want to thank Catherine for helping us with the technology again. But Tim, that you did a great job, a lot of research. I know you were your historian, so I know this was right up your alley. So thank you again. We all are very grateful. I just want to mention that there will be no women's breakfast next month. We'll have the women's retreat, which will be a Zoom retreat. The Reverend Joy Mounts will guide us in an exploration of our theme, May the Circle Be Unbroken. She's the Associate Chapter uh, Minister at First Congregational Church in Westfield. Um, she's led many retreats, and it will be held Friday, April 23rd in the evening, and then in the morning on April 24th, they will be resumed Will, will be Zoom sessions Friday and Saturday. And then we're going to be able to come back to the to our church lawn and have a box lunch where we'll be able to see everybody and be with everybody. Rain or shine will be there. We have canopies, we have porches. So, and we'll be sending out the menu soon for the uh, luncheon also. So we just really hope that you all can um, get into our uh, women's retreat. Uh, please sign up on the website where it says sign up so we know how many to plan for. Uh, again, hope to see you all next month, the 23rd and 24th. Again, thank you everyone for coming. And Tim, uh, Karen, if, can I just add two cents about the women's retreat? There's sure. no charge for the retreat and, or for lunch. No charge for the retreat, no charge for the lunch. So please let us know because we do need to know how much, how much, um, food to order and things like that. So that will be sent out soon. But thank you, Sarah. Yeah, we, we want it. We thought this is a year where we want everyone to come and we want people to um, uh, enjoy themselves and not have to put any money out. And um, uh, Reverend Mounts was with um, Mark Boyer, his church. So we have a little connection with her also. Um, so it's good to have her. She's an enthusiastic um, leader. So we're all excited about next month, okay? Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you again, Tim. It's been a blessing. Lots of angels we can see helped our church, and we continue to have angels. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tim.